Alrighty, hi guys. Welcome to my video, Gel Electrophoresis and Forensic Profiling. Um, this week is a bit of a doozy for some people because we introduce a lot of new ideas and a couple of them are a little abstract. So I'm going to try and explain, I'm, I'm going to just walk you through the whole process here um, so that we can try and help you understand um, how, or the, I, the processes and ideas behind the material of this week and then how you can go about solving the problems in your homework, because some of them require some specific techniques that aren't always obvious. <clears throat> All right, so let's see what we can do here. Um, so if you remember, so basically the idea behind this week is I want to try and identify someone based on their DNA. I wanna be able to look at someone's DNA and tell who that DNA belongs to. Um, this can be helpful in a lot of situations, such as um, such as trying to determine who a criminal is. So, crime um, crime investigation. So, like if I take a blood sample from a crime scene, and then I can try and match it to a culprit, um, <clears throat> or to try and determine um, parenthood. So. Um, trying to determine parents. Um, so there, there are a lot of reasons for this. You, you can use it in genealogy, um, all sorts of things. I probably spelled that wrong, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there are a lot of applications for this. Um, so now, now that we see the applications, we have to try and overcome a couple of hurdles here. First off, if I look at someone's genes, because that would be the obvious place to start looking, <clears throat> is to tell someone apart based on their genes. Humans have 23,000 genes in their body, which you don't need to know. It's, a, it's approximately 23,000 genes in the genome. Um, but the problem is, and we're going to learn about this more in week five, uh, but there are only so many ways you can alter a gene and have it still do its job. Um, there are, and there are a lot of ways that you can alter a gene and make it not do its job. So there are not very many options of alleles. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this term, an allele. An allele, we said, was a version of a gene. Basically, if the gene, in week one, I used a cookbook analogy, where if the chromosome is a cookbook that's got a recipes for how to build the proteins in your body, the genes are the recipes. Um, and <clears throat> if you've got a chocolate chip cookie recipe, you know, you may, your mom has a chocolate chip cookie recipe from her family and your dad has a chocolate chip cookie recipe from his family, but they don't necessarily agree on how to make a chocolate chip cookie. They could have different amounts of sugar, different amounts of flour, um, things like that. So those would be two different versions of a chocolate chip cookie recipe. Um, that would be an allele of a chocolate chip cookie recipe, if you bear with me on that analogy. So an allele is a version of a gene, meaning for example, if you've got a gene that has or that determines your eye color, then one allele of that gene could be blue eyes, and the other allele for that gene could be brown eyes or green eyes or etc. Um, <clears throat> so that's a version. Now, the the problem with genes, as I mentioned, is that there are only a certain number of alleles, right? There's only like what four or five hair colors. Um, so if I'm looking at genes to try and tell who the culprit is on my forensic case, and I look at that and I'm like, okay, this guy's got black hair. Great. So does half the world, right? Like that doesn't really help narrow down who, who the person is because there's just not enough variety in the genetic DNA from person to person to help tell them apart. So, <clears throat> I mean, what we could do is sequence the whole genome but right now that's still extremely expensive. There's a current race going on to see which company can figure out how to sequence the genome for less than $1,000. Um, police departments can't afford to sequence $1,000 worth of DNA every time they arrest someone. 
So we've got to try and find a cheaper option that can help me tell people apart more reliably than looking at their genes. If you remember back to week one, let me actually separate this. We said that there were three version or three types of DNA. Um, there were the genetic regions. Which had, um, which had the genes in it. Those were the ones that actually code for proteins. And then you've got the regulatory regions. Which say when you make it when you make a protein control when proteins are made proteins are made and then we had the junk regions <clears throat> and the junk regions do nothing they're pointless dna so far as we can tell we are finding some research that is saying that's not true but for the purposes of this class Junk regions do nothing. They don't impact how you turn out. They, they don't have, they don't code for proteins. They don't control when proteins are made. They just sit there. That's their whole job in life. It's just useless DNA that's just sitting there in your chromosomes. But this is actually where we want to look for our, um, for our forensic profiling. Because the junk regions, even though they do nothing for you as a person, they help us out a lot with forensics because if I get a mutation in the junk regions, meaning I, a sun ray hits me and it changes one of my bases, or DNA polymerase 3 makes a mistake when copying the chromosome and polymerase 1 doesn't catch the mistake, and so I accidentally change, um, change the junk region, nothing it doesn't hurt me it doesn't impact me because the junk regions don't do anything um if i get a change in a genetic region it could potentially kill me and so then or make me really sick so that i wouldn't pass the mutation on to my children that's why there's so little variety in the genetic regions but with junk regions if i get a change it doesn't hurt me so i'll pass it on so over seven thousand years of human existence we've we've accumulated quite a few mutations in the junk regions of our genome which means that my junk DNA is a lot more different from your junk DNA than my genetic DNA is from your genetic DNA. So by looking at the junk regions, I can, there's gonna be a lot more variety between individuals and hence, it'll be much easier to tell people apart in the junk regions, which is good for forensic profiling. <clears throat> I'm going to come back to this allele concept in a bit, so bear with me here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> turns out that there are special, or there are certain special spots within the junk DNA. They're usually in the satellite DNA parts of the junk DNA um, that are called STR loci. Loci is a, so there are two vocab words here. Loci is plural for locus, not locust like the grasshopper, locus. And what a locus is, is it's simply a location on a chromosome, like an address. Um, it's a spot on a chromosome where something that we care about lives. Um, so every gene has a locus, every, um, every spot on the chromosome is has a locus and it's each locus has its own name and the scientists have special patterns for how they name them. Um, but it's basically an address that helps me find a specific thing that I care about on the chromosome. That's all it is. It's just a location on the chromosome. Um, location on a chromosome. Um, so yeah, locus is singular, loci is plural. So multiple locuses is loci, okay? 
And then STR, this stands for, let me erase this to make room, stands for short tandem repeat. What that is, is there are these special, um, as at these STR loci, and they're scattered throughout the chromosomes, there's a bunch of them, um, but at these STR loci, we find these interesting little patterns where, let me just throw down a little, I'm just going to totally make up an example. Um, let's pretend that this particular STR loci, I'll just write a couple of random bases here, and then we've got T-A-T-T-A-T-T, -T -T -T. and then we'll go, I don't know, we'll add in a couple of random bases here. Okay, and it keeps going, okay? So I just gave you one strand, but, um, but you'll notice here in my little sequence here, we've got random base, random base, and then we've got, uh, let me change my marker here. We've got, there's A-T-T, A-T-T, A-T-T. A-T-T happens three times in a row. This right here is a short tandem repeat because it's actually in the name. We're very creative. It's short. It's only a few bases long. Tandem means next to each other. And ta-da, there's a couple of them next to each other. And they repeat over and over and over again. So we're very creative. So this is three short tandem repeats in a row at this particular location. So it's an STR locus um, because we've got a bunch of these STRs here. And STRs aren't always going to be ATT, and they are not always going to be three bases long either. Um, it depends on the particular locus. They could be two letters long, so it could be like ATATAT -A -T -A -T would be three STRs kind of thing. Um, or you could have a four base one where it's like CCGT, CCGT, etc. Um, so it entirely depends on the location. Um, at the, on the particular locus, what the actual repeat is and how long it is. Um, so we don't care so much about what the particular sequence of the STR is. Um, <clears throat> and we'll come back to that later. Um, so what, what's special about these, though, is occasionally um, when polymerase goes in here and copies it, the DNA accidentally folds a little bit and it just forgets to copy one of the STRs. And this doesn't happen very frequently, but it does happen. Um, and what would happen when, when that does occur is we would get this, or is the copy would be like this. Notice now this person only has two short tandem repeats at the same spot. And occasionally polymerase accidentally makes a mistake and adds a short tandem repeat or two. So then you could wind up with having four short tandem repeats. So now let's come back to my little allele definition. Earlier we said an allele was a version of a gene. Well, this week we're gonna kind of modify it a bit. It's actually a version of a locus. That's a much more broad definition of an allele. It's just a version of a locus, and that can be either a gene or a junk DNA locus. It's just a version of a particular location. Um, so at these STR loci, notice this is one version of this location. They've got three repeats in a row at this particular location. Down here, here's a different version of the same location. They only have two repeats. So this one up here, this would be a three repeat allele. And this one down here would be a two repeat allele of the same location. And because um, over time we've, we've accumulated these variations in the number of repeats of number of STR repeats at each location, um, there's a lot of variety. In fact, even in the same person, like this could be one person, because remember, you've got two copies of every chromosome. So on one copy of their chromosome, they could have three repeats at this spot. And on their other copy of their chromosome, they could have two. So based on my particular combination, so my particular combination of alleles at this location could be different from yours. I could have three repeats and two repeats, and you could have four repeats and seven repeats on your two chromosomes, which would help me tell of the two of us apart. 
that's much more helpful than genes. <clears throat> so now we've got, so now that we can use the, now that we know that we can use these STR loci to help tell people apart based on which alleles you got um, at these locations, now we have to solve our next problem. DNA is too small to see. And we've already, so I can't look at it and see how many repeats you have. Um, even our most powerful microscopes, DNA, the double-stranded helix just looks like a very thin black line. We can't tell how many repeats you have at a location by looking at it. And DNA sequencing is extremely expensive still. So somehow I have to be able, if I'm going to use these STRs to tell people apart, I have to somehow be able to tell how many repeats you have at a particular location um, it, it, so that I can figure out which allele you have. Um, and that's a little tricky. So we're going to use this really fun process. Actually, it's a pair of processes, one of which you already know. So let me erase this to make some room here. <laughs> Thicken this a little bit. Okay, here we go. If you remember, <clears throat> yeah, let me away this one. Don't erase that one too. Okay, here we go. If you remember last week, yes, we we do require you to remember week three still. Um, last week we talked about a process called PCR. You remember that stood for polymerase chain reaction. What we were doing in PCR was we were photocopying a particular segment of a chromosome, not the whole thing, just a particular segment of a chromosome in a test tube. Um, so outside of a cell, it was DNA replication outside of a cell. And we were copying a particular segment that we were interested in. So you had to pick two primers, one to go on either side, and they had to build and they would make an amplified product. Um, Amplified product. Now, if you remember, an amplified product, the way that you figured out how long the amplified product was on last week's homework was it was the length of the left primer plus the length of the right primer plus everything in between the two, right? So, or forward primer, reverse primer, and everything in between the two. Um, in base pairs. So it was this segment of DNA that was the length of the of the left primer to the end of the right, the beginning of the left primer to the end of the right primer. That was the amplified product. So <clears throat> let's pretend, I, I mean, we, you and I both know that primers are bigger than three bases, but bear with me. Let's pretend that we, we throw in a pair of primers. We're going to have one stick to this spot right here. Um, and the other one stick to the, I mean, on the opposite strand, of course, but bear with me, it's going to stick to this location right here. So we got our forward primer right here and our reverse primer right here. How long would be the amplified product? Um, assuming these pairs of primers would work together. So yeah, just bear with me. Um, it would be one, to, or the, the edge of the left primer to the edge of the right primer. So it'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 base pairs long. So the amplified product up here would be 15 base pairs long. Well, what if we use the same two primers on this one? So my primer that bound to CGT, and again, primers would be longer than that, but bear with me. So we'll we use a primer that binds to that one and a primer that binds to this one. It's the same two primers, right? How long would be the amplified product down here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. This one's 12 base pairs long. Notice we used the same pair of primers but came out with two different lengths of amplified product because the everything in between chunk changed length based on how many repeats there were in between the two primers. That is extremely helpful because notice, the more repeats I have, the longer my amplified product will be, right? 
So if I could sort DNA strands by, or so if I could do an amplified product, run PCR and pick a pair of primers that bracket this STR locus, and then I'm able to sort the resulting amplified products based on how long they are, I could tell how many repeats you have simply by how long your strand is. And I would never have to look at the actual sequence. Pretty cool, huh? So let's show you how we can do that. <coughs> Sorry, getting in a more comfortable position here. All right, here we are. In order to do that, we're going to bring in our second process. So the first process involved in forensic profiling was PCR, which you already knew how to do. The next process is called gel electrophoresis. Let me write that out here. gel electrophoresis. It's quite a mouthful there. Gel electrophoresis. And what gel electrophoresis is, is it's a process that's designed to help scientists sort DNA based on length. Um, so a process used to sort DNA segments by length, <clears throat> which can be helpful because it can help me determine how many STR repeats I have in my amplified product. So let's show you, let me show you how this process works because it's really cool. <clears throat> and I'm going to use some pictures from my uh, from my website over here. Um, on. So if, here's the basic idea behind how this works. If you've ever been to like a party and you see these, um, these inflatable um, obstacle courses, basically the idea is run through the obstacle course as fast as you can racing at somebody else and try not to get yourself killed while dodging all these obstacles and having a great time in the process, right? That's the idea. Now, if we were having a race between, now let's pretend there's a race between an extremely tall person and a really short person going through one of these inflatable mazes, who do you think would win? It would most likely be the short guy because the tall guy is going to get all tangled up in these obstacles. He's going to be less maneuverable in the close confines of this obstacle course and so he's going to have a harder time navigating the obstacles than the really short guy that will be able to just zip through them all. So the short guy will be able to travel farther through the obstacle course in the same amount of time as the tall guy only goes a little ways. We can use that same idea for DNA. We use this stuff called agarose. Um, it's, it's like a little white powder here. We get it from seaweed. Um, and essentially, it's just really expensive jello. That's all it is. Um, it's really expensive jello that holds its shape at room temperature. So normal jello melts into a liquid unless you're refrigerated. This one stays in the jello states at room temperature, which is lovely. The other nice thing about it is it's not as fragile as real jello. So jello likes to flop all apart. Um, Whereas this one, it, it actually holds its shape pretty decently. It can tear if you're not careful, but it, it holds its shape pretty decently. So it's a win across the board. So <clears throat> what we're going to do here is do is make it exactly like you would a pan of jello. We take the powder and we add it to some warm water and you stir it in there and then you pour it into a mold and let it harden. Um, or uh, congeal, I suppose. It doesn't necessarily harden it becomes jello. But the, the interesting thing about this one is rather than pouring it in like a casserole dish, we pour it so that it's only like a millimeter thick. So this really, really, really thin piece of jello. And we pour it in like a little square or a rectangle that's just a couple of inches wide. Um, and let it let it cool and solidify. And that gives us a little rectangle. This is a digital version, but that gives us a little rectangle called a gel. That's our little flat rectangle of agarose jello. We call it a gel. Now, if you look at it, if we were to zoom in on the gel, 
with a really powerful microscope, you would see that what the gel is made of is this meshwork of little fibers. Um, it's basically just a big, huge web of these tangled fibers all together with a bunch of holes in between them all. And those holes are just big enough for a DNA strand to fit through like a snake, like slither through it. Um, <clears throat> so it's like a three-dimensional network or a maze so what we've got here is essentially a DNA obstacle course. The whole goal is to have the DNA go through this meshwork, it's a three-dimensional maze here, and try and get to the other side, just like our little inflatable obstacle course. And because DNA works on the same principle as our tall person and short person, the shorter a DNA strand is going through this gel, the farther it will make through make it through the gel in the same amount of time that a longer strand will. Um, so that so we can use this gel to help me separate DNA strands based on how long they are, or DNA segments based on how long they are, because shorter strands will travel farther through the gel than bigger strands will. And we're gonna um, well, yeah, actually, let me get to that in a sec. So the the problem though is DNA doesn't have legs. So unlike a human, it can't run through the maze. So somehow we have to compel the DNA to go through the maze. And this is where the electrophoresis part of the name comes from. We, take, we set up this little contraption down here. <clears throat> so here's my gel right here. We lay it down flat inside a little bowl of special water called buffer. And the whole goal of the buffer, the buffer is basically just fancy water. It's got some other chemicals in it to make sure that the that the pH is right and whatnot, but basically it's fancy water. We put it in this little tub of water, and then we punch these little holes at the top of the gel. They're just little rectangles, um, these little tiny holes at the top, and, and then we hook a battery up to this thing. It, it's not a real battery, it's like a, a little power generator, but yeah, it's basically a battery. Um, and we put one terminal on one end of the tub and the other terminal on the other end of the tub. Now, DNA is negatively charged. Um, and charge works just like a magnet. So if you have like a North Pole and a South Pole, they attract to each other. And if you've got two South Poles together, they repel each other, right? So North is attracted to South and South is repelled from South. So, Negative is repelled from fellow negatives and attracted to positive charges. That's how charge works. So the phosphates in the DNA backbone are negatively charged. So that makes DNA negatively charged. So we use this little pipette syringe here to take some DNA and stick it in one of the little holes that we punched at the top of the gel. Now what's going to happen is the DNA here is negatively charged. And we've got the negative terminal of the battery up here next to, the, next to it and the positive one at the other end. So what does the DNA want to do? It wants to run away from the negative terminal and go towards the positive one because negatives repel negatives and are attracted to positives. So it's going to get dragged through the maze because it's getting pushed away from that one and towards that one. So we're dragging it through the maze. Um, so that's how we get it to go through the maze is we're using electricity to haul this DNA through the maze based or using electrical charge. And that way we're able to run it through, through the maze, which then sorts them based on size. So that's how gel electrophoresis works. Now, when you're done, you come out with something that looks like this. So just to orient you here, the holes that we punched would be right about here. Uh, like right here. So this is where this is where the little holes would be that we punched at the top of the gel. They're going to be up here. So we poured the DNA into this one and then it ran from top to bottom. So up here was where our negative terminal was. Let me switch to red here since it stands out better. Up here was where our negative terminal was and down here's where our positive was. So the DNA is traveling top to bottom. So I would expect shorter strands to travel farther, hence get closer to the bottom. 
then bigger strands will. So because we did PCR and we made like 10 bajillion copies, we're going to get all of the copies that are of similar length are going to travel through the gel the same distance in the same amount of time. And so you're going to wind up with this little stripe that looks like this. We call it a band. You're going to wind up with this little stripe. And what the little stripe is, is the 10 bajillion copies of the amplified product all stopping in the same spot. And that's why we had to do PCR, not only to isolate my amplified product, but to make enough copies of it that I could see it. If you have one person, you can't see them from space. If you've got like 7 billion people all standing together, you can probably see that from space. So if we get enough copies of them and they all travel through the gel together, they'll all congregate and I can actually see them as a band. That's, that's the whole point of doing the PCR there. Um, so you see this band, and what that is, is a bunch of strands that were all the same length. And then we've got a second band down here. And you'll notice since the DNA travels in a vertical, or top to bottom here, in a straight line, it doesn't go across like this. It just goes top to bottom. We can, or we've, we've got this little imaginary column here that we call a lane, similar to a bowling lane. Um, so you've got the bowler standing at the top and he bowls down this way kind of thing. It's a lane. And because, um, because they travel vertically like this, I can actually run several lanes side by side, each one having its own little hole at the top and the DNA traveling top to bottom. So each lane is going to contain the DNA from one person. So I would put the DNA that I took from one person in lane one and run it, and then a different person in lane two and run that one, lane three, run that one, lane four, et cetera, um, to run them through. <clears throat> so now if we try to interpret what this means, let's clear away some of this material here. <laughs> okay, so if I'm trying to interpret what this means, we know that because, because we know that we started at the top and we're traveling towards the bottom, we know that this stripe represents a strand that is shorter than this one, which also means since we determined that the fewer or that the more repeats you have, the longer strand you have, we know this one has fewer STR repeats than this one. but I don't know how many they are. I just know this one has fewer repeats than that one is. And in order to figure out your allele, I have to be able to tell which, or in order to figure out which alleles you have, I have to be able to tell how many repeats there are, not just that you have one that's shorter than the other one. So, but by looking at those stripes, I can't tell how many repeats that stripe represents. I need something to measure it against. I need a ruler of some sort. So what we do is we have a company that makes amplified products, that manufactures amplified products of known length. So they make pieces of DNA that they know how long they are. And they make a bunch of them of different lengths. And they dump them all together in a tube and mail it to me. And I'm going to put that one in one of these columns. I'm going to add it in column five over here and run it at the same time I run these other columns here. So because there's so many different lengths of DNA in this one, I'm going to get a bunch of stripes, not just two. I'm going to get a bunch of stripes. Um, and then what I and then they write on the side of the tube they that they mailed me, they tell me the lengths of the pieces that they of DNA that they added in there. They tell me how many repeats each piece represents that they put in there. So if they tell me that the shortest, or if they tell me that their tube contains a five repeat, a six repeat, a seven, an eight, a nine, a 10, an 11, a 12, a 13, a 14, and a 15, I know that their shortest one was a five, and so that means that the stripe that traveled farthest through the gel is the shortest one, hence that must represent a five repeat segment of DNA. 
Then the next shortest one was a six and a seven and an eight all the way up. So now I have a ruler to measure against because I know that a five repeat allele will travel just as far in column five as a five repeat allele would in column one or column two or column three. So if this stripe traveled just as far as that stripe did, and the tube says that stripe represents five repeats, that must mean this is a five repeat allele. And this stripe up here traveled just as far as the nine repeat did in my ruler column over here. So this represents a nine repeat allele. So this person in column one here has a five repeat allele and a nine repeat allele. And the way that we write that um, is we write the five and then we separate it with a comma and then the nine. You could technically write it nine five, but scientists traditionally, so this wouldn't be wrong, but scientists traditionally write the smaller number first and the bigger number second, um, simply because we're OCD. <laughs> so, um, so this person has a five nine combo at whatever location we did the PCR on. This combination of alleles here, let me, let me erase that one. So this little combination of alleles that the person has at the location is called their genotype. And the genotype is the combination of alleles that a particular person has at a locus. Because remember, you have two copies of every locus because you have two copies of every chromosome. So that means this person has five repeats on one of their chromosomes and nine on the other one. <laughs> so everybody has to have two stripes because everybody has two copies of every chromosome. So this person over here, let's go look at column three, for example, this person would have a six repeat allele and a 14 repeat allele. So you read them horizontally, vertically are the people, horizontally is the measurement. Um, so this person, yeah, has a six and a 14. Over here, we've got a six and a seven. Now what's going on here in column two? This guy only has one stripe. So what does that mean? He's not missing a chromosome. That's what a lot of people think. He's not missing a chromosome. What's actually going on here is he still has two stripes. They're just sitting on top of each other. Both stripes traveled the same distance in the same amount of time and stopped at the same spot. So what that means is both of his alleles, the SDR loci on both chromosomes, are the same length. So this gentleman, his one stripe stopped at the 10 spot. So that means this gentleman's combo, his genotype, is 10-10 because he has to have two alleles because he's got two copies of the chromosome, but because there's only one stripe, that means both alleles were the same. They traveled the same distance in the same amount of time. Hence, he would have a 10-10 combo because he only has one stripe. Now, here's some more vocab words for you. If, if the genotype has two different alleles in it, meaning it's five and nine for, or six and 12 or anything where the two alleles are different, we call that a homozygous, or sorry, hetero, forgive me, my brain's not working this morning. We call that heterozygous. Hetero meaning half. So it's half and half. Um, so heterozygous. And when there's the two of them that are the same in the genotype, like 1010 or 99 or 1414, we call that homozygous. Homo meaning same. So homozygous is where both alleles in the genotype are the same. Heterozygous means they're two different ones. So if they're heterozygous, they'll have two different stripes. If they're homozygous, they'll only have one stripe or band. Now, one other vocab term here, this column over here where we did our little ruler, it's got a couple of different names. The one that they used on your homework is called the DNA, they called it the allelic marker. So 
So that's the allelic marker. Another term that you might see is the DNA ladder. That's the other term that they that is sometimes used. But the one that they use on your homework is the allelic marker. That's simply the ruler. So that doesn't represent a person. These other columns represent four different people. But that allelic marker column isn't a person. That's the ruler. That's the measurement to help me tell how long the other people are. Um, okay. So now that we that you understand how gel electrophoresis works and how to read one, um, you have the ability to go and do the first question here on your homework. So what we've got here on your homework is we ran three gels at the same time, each one with the amplified products from a different location in the same person. So just to orient you here, you've got Okay, just to orient you here, here's your top. Again, we ran the gels top to bottom, and you've got three different gels here. Ooh, that line's a little thicker than I wanted it to be. Here we go. You got three gels here. So one of them is right here. Then you got one down here. And then you've got a third one right here. And don't get confused, the labels, so these little labels here, D13S317, that's the name of the locus, that's its address. Um, so scientists that knows more about how this stuff works, they could look at that and know precisely what chromosome and what spot on the chromosome this particular locus is at. You don't need to know that. That's just the name of the location where we got this DNA from. Um, so, but one thing that confuses students is notice we put the labels underneath the gel. So this top gel is the D16 one, even though the label is under it. Um, so make sure not to get confused on that one. So we've got three gels here for three different locations. And then we've got 10 column or 10 lanes going across the top here. And notice <coughs> we've got two allelic markers this time. I did one in column five and one in column 10. That's simply for convenience. They're both the same allelic marker. They just put it there so that you didn't have to go clear from column 10 over to column one to check the ruler. You could just go from column five to column one and then from column 10 over to column six. That's simply for convenience. Both five and 10 are allelic markers, not people. But columns one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, and nine have the DNA for eight different people in them. And we ran them top to bottom. And then it, those columns are the same or those lanes are the same for all three gels. So what our little key down here says is the DNA for Maggie Mortis, which you can read the little story here, but the DNA for Maggie Mortis is in lane one. So this stripe right here represents the DNA that she has. So this stripe right here represents the DNA she has at, DNA, uh, at D16. And notice if we come across here, we know that she has one stripe. Notice there's not a second one here. She has one stripe at the nine repeat spot. So that means she must have a nine nine combo, which is what they told you here in your little table right here. They said at D16, she has a nine nine combo. That's where she got it, or that's where they got that number. And then she's still in column one of this second location. So she's got one stripe right here which is at the 10 location. So that means she's a 10-10 at D7, which they told you that's true. Then down here, she's still in column one. She's got two stripes and there's one right here and there's one right there. So she's an 8-14 combo, which they told you. And again, 14-8 is not incorrect, but we usually write the smaller number first and the bigger number second. Now, let me make a couple of points here that people get confused with. Um, I get questions about these every semester, so let's see if we can help you with that. Right here, you'll notice this individual in column, gosh, one, two, three, four, five, six. In column six, on this third gel, this individual in column six has three stripes. There's one right here, one right here, and one right here. And people are like, ah, I know what happens when one, and, and you're, 
when one stripe is there or two stripes, well, what about three? What that is, is it's an error. Um, occasionally, the people that make these gels make, some, make a mistake. And so this thin, small stripe is what we call an artifact. You don't need to know that. But basically, it's contamination. Uh, maybe there was some DNA on the counter when they were um, when they were preparing this sample or whatnot. So ignore that stripe. Use the other two. The other thing to note on this problem is up here on this top one, this first gel, people panic because they see this stripe right here that comes across to right there. And they're like, ah, it's not a nine and it's not an 11. What is it? Is it okay to use a 10? They didn't mark it. Yes, please use a 10. That stripe represents 10. We just, the lines were so close together that we couldn't use a reasonable font size and still make all the numbers fit. So we just decided to label every other one. So that stripe still represents 10. You just have to use your imagination and pretend it's labeled 10 because the one above it is an 11 and the one below it's a nine. So it's okay to have a stripe not labeled, just use, um, just use your imagination and figure out what it is based on what other ones are labeled. Those are the main questions that I get on that one. So your whole goal on question one is to just come in here and fill out the table with the particular combinations for each person or sample from the gel. That's all you have to do. That's problem one. <clears throat> problem two, we're going to take it one step further. So you've so we've given you another gel. So this is a situation where we've, we've got three babies and six parents and somebody mixed up the babies at the hospital. Some nurse is going to get fired. Um, so somebody mixed up the babies. So your job is to figure out which um, baby belongs to which couple. And we are assuming fidelity here. So father A made a baby with mother A. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> so again, we've got three gels. And the labels are underneath the gel. So that top gel is the D16 locus. D7 is the middle gel. D13 is the bottom gel. <clears throat> okay. Um, so what you're going to do, you're going to do the same thing we did in question one. We're just going to take it one step further because now not only do you have to figure out what their genotype is, what their allele combo is at each location, but you also need to assign babies to parents. So in order to help you do that, we've given you page three. So page three isn't a separate question. It's there to help you solve page two. And what the, down here, we've given you these little templates that are called Punnett squares. So these three things right here are Punnett squares. And we're kind of introducing the idea this week, but we're going to really hammer it down in week six and seven. So this isn't the last time you're going to see a Punnett square. Week six and seven are all about Punnett squares. We love Punnett squares in week six and seven. Um, so we'll introduce the idea here and come back to it. <clears throat> the idea behind a Punnett square is to help you pr predict random fertilization. If you remember back to week, uh, gosh, two, um, Random fertilization is one of the three randomization methods of to produce genetic variety. So you have one sperm and one egg, but we don't know, because there's a bunch of different sperms and a bunch of different eggs, we don't know which one's going to hit which egg. Um, so what this, what the idea behind a Punnett square is to say what possible babies can this couple make? <laughs> and the way it works, so you're, you're gonna go up to the gel and figure out what their actual combos are. I'm going to totally make up numbers here just to show you how this table works. So please don't use the same numbers as I am. Go look at the gel on page two to figure out what the real allele combos are. Let's pretend I look at the gel and father A has a 10-11 combo. And let's pretend that mother A has, gosh, a 7-9 a combo, OK? at this D7 locus. So yeah, make sure you're looking at the correct gel when you get these numbers. Um, you should be able to solve this problem using only the D7 locus. That's why we gave you only Punnett squares to do that one. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's pretend these are the right numbers. They aren't, but let's pretend just to show you. Okay, so the way that I'm gonna add this to the Punnett square is on the father's side, I'm gonna put the 10 in this box and the 11 in this box. 
And on mom, I'm going to put the seven in this box and the nine in this box. It's okay if you flip them, you're going to get the same answer either way. Um, <clears throat> and then what this says is if, because we know each parent is only going to contribute one, um, or one uh, allele to their kid, because we learned in week two that every parent contributes one copy of every chromosome to their kid. So they're going to give one copy of every locus to their kid. Um, so the dad will either give a 10 or an 11 to their kid, and the mom will either give a 7 or a 9 to the kid. So in box 5 here, what that means is if mom gives a 7 and dad gives a 10, you're going to make a baby that has a 7-10 combo. In box 6, what that means is if mom gives a 7 and dad gives an 11, you're going to have a 7-11 baby. They're going to own a really big grocery store chain and make lots of money. Ha 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 ha. Okay. Sorry. Bear with me. All okay. right. Then this box, it would be if mom gave a nine and dad gave a 10. And this box over here is mom gave a nine and dad gave an 11. So what this tells me is parents A are capable of making a 710 baby, a 711 baby, a 910 baby, or a 911 baby. Okay. So then if we went and looked at the at the gel up there, and let's say we came out with a handful of babies here that let, let's say we've got an 812 baby and a 99 baby and a 910 baby. Okay, those are their combos. Well, you could look and see, well, of those three babies, these guys can make a 910 baby. That is one of the babies they are capable of making, but they can't make an 812 or a 99 baby. So this one, in my little in my little pretend scenario, this baby here would belong to parents A. You see how we did that? You you so you do the Punnett square to figure out what possible babies they could make, and then look at the babies to figure that one out. Now let me show you one other. And you're going to do that for all three of them, figure out which baby belongs to which couple. Um, now, the let me show you one other thing that sometimes messes with people here. Uh, let me try this little example right here. Uh, let's see. Let's pretend father C, mother C, let me see, brainstorming here. Okay, yeah. We'll do, let's pretend we've got a 9-10 combo here and a 9-11 combo right here. Okay, <clears throat> so they could make a 9-9 a or a 9-10. Again, I totally made these numbers up. You'd have to go get the real ones from up there. Um, and a 9-11 and a 10-11, okay? Notice both this couple and this couple can make the nine or, or oh sorry oh yeah okay both this couple and this couple are capable of making a nine ten baby so either couple could potentially create infant three but you're not going to write a or c here kind of thing because we're we have to give the baby to someone we're not gonna play a Solomon here and chop the baby in half, right? That's that's not okay. We need to give the baby to someone. So you can't give it to A or C, you have to give it to one of them. <laughs> so how do you tell which one is the parents of baby C? It's process of elimination. Notice these guys are capable of making babies three or baby two in my little example here, right? They can make a nine nine baby or a nine ten baby. But these guys are only capable of making a 910 baby. So that must mean that baby three belong in my little scenario here belongs to parent A and baby two belongs to parent C because this is the only one that can make baby two. So that must belong to them because it can't belong to anyone else. And then by process of elimination, baby three goes to them. So if you get if you get a pair of Punnett squares where you get two couples that can make the same baby do a process of elimination and figure out which baby can only be made by one couple and then give the 
give the remaining one to the guy that can only make that baby. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's all you got to do is figure out or is fill out the Punnett squares, figure out which which parents can make which baby, and write out those answers here. And that answers page two and page three. Okay. And again, I used made up numbers. Don't copy my numbers here. Okay. So that's how you would do that kind of problem. Okay. Um, now this last page here is covered in my other video um, called Frequency Calculations, What They Are and How We Find Them. So if you, if you want help with that last page, go watch my other video on my week four page. Um, <clears throat> continuing on this idea here, let's pop over to my, or to the other homework assignment here. Um, your King Tut assignment. But this is all you need to turn in is slide 10 right here. Okay, that's all you need to turn in here. So uh, everything beforehand is just explaining slide 10 and 9. The goal behind this one here, let me size this down to a reasonable size again. Okay, the goal behind this here is we've got seven mummies, and your job is to figure out. Or, and this is the family tree. This is their relationship. Your job is to figure out who belongs where. So here's a bit of orientation to pedigrees. We'll come back to pedigrees in week eight, but here's a little bit of orientation. Squares are men, circles are women. If you've got a horizontal line between two people, that means they're married. If you've got a vertical line down to someone, that means it's their kid. There's another example of a kid. And if you've got a double horizontal line between two people. That means they are married siblings. So this man and that woman are siblings. They came from the same parents. Makes Christmas easy, right? You only have to go to one grandparent's house. It's wonderful. Um, <laughs> um, so the, the other point that will help you solve this is for those of you that don't know your history, King Tut didn't have any children. He's known as the boy king. So this is Tut, or Tutankahumun, or whatever, however you pronounce that. It's that guy, Tutankahumun. Um, so Tut is the bottom of the tree. Now, let, now that we've given you that orientation here, let's come and look at this page here. This page looks really crazy, but honestly, you've seen it before. This is basically a fancified rendition of this kind of table, but it's expanded. So all we did here was we gave, rather than giving you a gel, we just told you what the gel said. Aren't we kind? And then rather than doing it at just three loci, we're, we gave you their combos at eight different loci, okay? So what this means here is at the D13 locus, King Tut has a 10-12 combo. Okay, so notice this isn't structured like a gel. Do not think of this like a gel. This is simply a data table that tells you what a gel said. So Tut has a 10-12 combo. Yuya at the same location has an 11-13 combo, et cetera, okay? And then, and then Tut at the D7 location has a 10-15, okay? The way you're going to solve this and I, I've seen lots of different ways of solving this. Here's the way that makes most sense to me. And so this is the one that I recommend to people, but you're welcome to solve this however you'd like. Um, <clears throat> you know that every child has to be a combination of their parents, which means Tut had to get one of his allele at, at all eight of his locations. Tut had to get one allele from his mom and one allele from his dad. So in order for any of these other people to be his parents, they have to be able to contribute at least one of his two alleles at all eight spots. If they can do it at seven, but not the eighth one, they're out. So for example, Tut has a 10-12 combo right here. Can Yuya either give a 10 or a 12? No, Yuya doesn't have a 10 or a 12 to give, which means Yuya can't be Tut's father. I don't even have to look at the other seven locations because Yuya can't be Tut's father because where did the 10 or the 12 come from? So that means you can eliminate Yuya as Tut's father. 
straight off the bat. But then you can go keep going down. Thuya could give a 12, TA could give a 12, Amenhotep could give a 10, Akhenaten could give a 10 or a 12, and K that one could give a 10 or a 12. So we've got, or, so we eliminate, in the first round, we eliminated Yuya, but all of the others could potentially still be Tut's parent. So then you're gonna go to the next location and do it again. And then the next location and the next one and the next one and the next one. And anytime you find somebody that fails to be able to contribute an allele to Tut, they're out. And you'll just narrow it down until you get two people. And when you get to those two people, you will fill them in here and here. And then you, you're gonna play the same story. If, um, so, so let, I mean, we know Yuya is not his father, but let's pretend that he was so that I can show you the idea, but not give away the answers. Okay, so let's pretend Yuya and Thuya here were Tut's parents. Okay, um, again, I'm totally making this up. You're gonna have to actually do the problem, the assignment. But let's pretend these are the, the these are his parents. We know that Tut's parents are siblings. So if, if I had determined that they were his parents, then I would come write Yuya here and Thuya right here. Okay, that um, again, you're gonna have to go do the assignment yourself. I'm totally making that up. Okay, so I would put them in there. Now we know that they're siblings. So pick, so you're gonna play the same game here to figure out who the next generation up is. So if Yuya and Thuya were Tut's parents, what I would do is come up here. I know Tut can't be his parents' parent. So Tut's out already. And then you're going to pick one of the two. So let me pretend that, I, so let's focus on Yuya here. I'll let him be the new kid. And we know Thuya can't be her brother's parent. So she would be out too then. And then I would play the same game, except instead of Tut being the kid, Yuya would be the kid in my little fanciful scenario here. Um, and so then I would have to go say, okay, who can contribute an allele to Yuya? Um, and then you would narrow it down to two and that would be the Tut's grandparents. And then the last two would be the great grandparents. So that's how you'll play this game is you just work bottom to top with Tut being the bottom and then just do a process of elimination. And for each generation, you find the kid, you make a kid and figure out which two people can contribute an allele at all eight locations to that kid. And eventually you'll be able to fill out the whole tree. Okay. And again, don't follow my numbers. I didn't do this problem for you. I just wanted to show you the principle, but you'll have to go do it yourself. And that's all there is to it. That's forensic profiling and gel electrophoresis. And again, Go watch my other video if you want help with frequency calculations on the last page here of your forensic profiling but, um, homework. Sorry, this video is a little all over the place um, and I talked a lot, but hopefully it was helpful. If you've got any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is uh, dallin.stokes17 at gmail.com or you can text me at 505-500-6331 or you can definitely set up a tutoring appointment. Um, I'm happy to meet with you. You can set up a tutoring appointment through iPlan. I'm happy to meet up with you and talk through any problems you've got. So hopefully this video helped. Thanks for watching and have a wonderful day.